Welcome to Chapter 2, Video 4, Basic Translation Strategies for Conditional and Biconditional. Now you remember that we'll use the arrow symbol for our if-then conditional and the double arrow symbol for our if and only if by conditional. Take our first sentence here, straightforward, simple conditional. If Bob goes to the fair, then Anne will drive. We can symbolize this simply with B for Bob goes to the fair in front of the arrow, and D for Anne will drive after the arrow. Now remember, conditionals have two distinct parts. We have the antecedent, and then we have the consequent. You can think of the antecedent as the if part, and the consequent as the then part. The antecedent comes before the arrow, the consequent comes after the arrow. Now the order of the antecedent and consequent is important. If we reverse the order of this symbolization, like that, we would have an entirely different symbolization. That one says, if Anne drives, then Bob goes to the fair. So for this sentence, it's actually not correct. So keeping the order straight is important with the conditional. The conditional, unlike conjunction and disjunction, is not commutative. Take a look at our sen second sentence here. We've changed the order of the English. We've got Anne will drive if Bob goes to the fair. Does that require us to change the order of our symbolization? Well, if you look carefully, we've got if, which indicates the antecedent portion of the symbolization, Bob goes to the fair, and then Anne will drive, despite the fact that it comes first in the English, is the consequent, and in our symbolizations, the consequent will always come second. So we get the same symbolization despite the change in word order in the English. They actually have an equivalence here, and so we get the exact same symbolization in our language S. The conditional is not only used to express if then, it can also express only if. We need to be careful how we do this. Anne will drive only if Bob goes to the fair. Is that the same as above? Actually, no, that's going to be incorrect. When we see only if by itself, what follows it is actually the consequent of a conditional. So we've got Bob goes to the fair after the arrow, and Anne drives in front of it. This may seem a bit confusing at first, because normally you would read this as if Anne drives, then Bob goes to the fair, and now I'm telling you to read it as Anne drives only if Bob goes to the fair. But if you think about it, these two readings are actually equivalent. Take the English, Anne will drive only if Bob goes to the fair. So, if she drove, then he must have gone to the fair, because she drives only if Bob goes to the fair. We'll continue to talk about this as we go along, so if it's not entirely clear yet, don't worry about it. Just remember that the conditional can express both the if-then and the only if. And when we have if by itself, that indicates the antecedent, whereas when we have only if by itself, that indicates the consequent. So applying that principle here in the next sentence, we've changed the English word order again, but if we follow our rule that only if indicates the consequent, we will again have B after the arrow and Anne driving D in front of the arrow. So again, this pair is also equivalent. All we've done is change the English word order, but that order doesn't change in our symbolization.
Finally, in the basic patterns we've got here, we can sometimes have if and only if. When we have those two together, we can do a combination of what we've got above. If Bob goes to the fair, then Ann will drive. And Ann drives only if Bob goes to the fair. But of course we also have our double arrow, so we can express that conjunction much more compactly just by writing B if and only if D, or what would be equivalent D if and only if B, because the double arrow is commutative. All three of those formulas are correct and they're all equivalent. Now we can sum up the current discussion we've been having with this diagram here. This reiterates just what I've been saying. When we have if by itself, what follows the if goes into the antecedent to the conditional, no matter the order of the English phrases. Similarly, when we have only if by itself, whatever follows the only if goes into the consequent of the conditional no matter the order of the English phrases. So what follows the if by itself is the antecedent. What follows the only if by itself is the consequent. And of course the easy case, when we have if and only if together, whether it's written this way or this way or this way, or the way mathematicians and logicians like to write it with a double F, then we use the double arrow and the order doesn't matter because the double arrow is commutative. Now, the conditional and the biconditional can also be used to express simple, sufficient, and or necessary conditions. Consider the following sentences. For Bob to go to the fair, it is necessary that Anne drives. What that means is that Bob goes to the fair only if and drives. So we can symbolize it in this fashion. Bob goes to the fair only if and drives. What happens is the condition that is stated to be necessary goes into the consequent portion of a conditional. It doesn't matter what the English word order is either. We've got here and driving is necessary for Bob to go to the fair. So that is going to go into the consequent of our conditional and we'll get the exact same translation for the first and second sentences because of course they're equivalent. Consider now a statement of sufficient conditions. For Bob to go to the fair it is sufficient that Anne drives. Well sufficient conditions are actually going to go in the antecedent of our conditional. If Anne drives, that's enough, sufficient, for Bob to go to the fair. So if she drives, Bob goes to the fair. Similarly, the English phrase order doesn't really matter. If it's Anne's driving that's said to be sufficient, then that is going to go in the antecedent of the conditional. If she drives, then Bob goes to the fair. And finally, we can combine necessary and sufficient conditions. And driving is necessary and sufficient for Bob to go to the fair. And this can be expressed either with a conjunction of the above two sentences. Driving is necessary. And her driving is sufficient. Or we can use good old double arrow and just do one of these two translations. Either one is fine because of course the double arrow is commutative. So we see similar patterns developing here to the translations we did just a bit earlier. And in fact we can look at a similar diagram. Consider the following schematic sentence for a moment. We use meta variable A, arrow, 
meta variable b. So what we have here is just the form of any old conditional. If we look at the two diagrams on the right hand side, we'll notice how similarly structured they are. If we ask ourselves next, what is this statement saying? Is it saying if a then b or is it saying a only if b or a is sufficient for b or is it saying b is necessary for A. Well, the answer is it's saying all of these. Because what we can say is that in every conditional the antecedent expresses sufficient conditions for the consequent or the consequent expresses necessary conditions for the antecedent and any conditional can be read as if the antecedent then the consequent or antecedent only if the consequent. So the conditional has multiple readings, all of which we take to be equivalent. One last truth functional concept that I want to cover here with the conditional is unless. Take a look at the first two sentences here. Bob goes to the fair unless Carol goes to the fair. Or what is essentially equivalent, unless Carol goes to the fair, Bob goes to the fair. How should we symbolize this? Most people think initially that it should be something like this. If Carol goes to the fair, then Bob doesn't go to the fair. Or, if Bob goes to the fair, then Carol doesn't go to the fair this is actually going to turn out to be incorrect. Why is that incorrect? Well, pay very careful attention to what the English statement is saying. To understand this English sentence, consider the following question. If Bob is not at the fair, what must have happened? Well, Carol must have gone to the fair. So what we've got is, if Bob is not at the fair, if he did not go, then Carol went. Now what happens if Carol doesn't go? If Carol doesn't go, the sentence tells us that Bob goes. Now, the reason the initial two translations turn out to be incorrect is it might be the case that even if Carol goes to the fair, Bob still goes. What we're being told by the English is that the only thing that will cause him not to go is if Carol goes. So Carol's going is necessary for him to not go. And remember, necessary conditions go in the consequent. Another way of looking at this is her not going is sufficient for him to go, sufficient conditions appear in the antecedent. What the original English does not tell us is that her going is sufficient for him not to go. It is just a situation which is necessary for him not to go. Let's take a look at the second pair of sentences here. Bob won't throw up unless he rides the roller coaster. Now keep in mind we've got a negation in here. So given that we say Bob won't throw up unless he rides the roller coaster, let's suppose that Bob does throw up. We have Y for Bob throws up. 
If he threw up, then what must have happened? He must have ridden the roller coaster. Unless he rides the roller coaster, Bob won't throw up. So what'll happen if he doesn't ride the roller coaster? Well, then he won't throw up. Take a look at the first two sentences. Both of these conditionals are equivalent to the following disjunction. Either Bob goes or Carol goes. Since it's an inclusive or, that includes the possibility that they both go. That's one way of understanding how Carol's going is a necessary condition for Bob's not going. But it's not a sufficient condition. They might both go at the same time. The one thing that cannot happen, according to the English sentence and our translation of it, it cannot happen that both Bob and Carol don't go. Because if Carol doesn't go, then Bob definitely is. And if Bob didn't go, that must be because Carol did. So if you look at the bottom two sentences, we've got Bob won't throw up, and we've got Bob rides the roller coaster. So either he doesn't throw up, or he rides the roller coaster, possibly both. So the schemas on the right demonstrate what we've been talking about here. Whenever you have an unless, it's stating that one condition is necessary for the failure of the other. It doesn't even really matter which order you put them in, as long as the condition that goes in the antecedent is negated. Another way of looking at that, then, is that the failure of one condition is sufficient for the fulfillment of the other. Or, if this all seems terribly confusing, you can always treat the unless as an or, a disjunction. Now, look at our second pair of sentences. The throwing up one is negated, so if we were to follow the schema exactly as over here, then what goes in the antecedent should be the original statement, not throwing up with a negation attached. But of course, the double negation is equivalent to no negation at all, so we don't actually need those two, and that's why I didn't put them in in the first place. But since the negation is in that statement from the beginning, it needs to be attached there and there. Now, unless can be pretty confusing, and the main reason is, is that it's very rarely used in English, except when we're already assuming that the condition, that one condition, is sufficient for the failure of the other. That's why these translations here seem to be so natural. But that's something having to do with the scope of the conversation and background information that we don't take account of in the single sentence itself. That's enough for now. Combining these various building blocks for translations into more and more complicated translations is how you will learn to become proficient at translating from English into the language S.